Welcome to Building Bridges for Translational Research, a special edition podcast series produced by the Scientist Creative Services team. This series is brought to you by Cytiva, a global provider of technologies and services that advance and accelerate therapeutic development, manufacturing, and delivery. To take preclinical concepts to the market, translational researchers must build strong relationships and forge fruitful partnerships that support their work. In this podcast, we talk with groundbreaking translational researchers and industry experts about their experiences developing technologies and therapies for improving human health and our world at large. In this episode, Nikki Spahic from the Scientist Creative Services team spoke with Guang Ping Gao, a professor and the director of the Hori Gene Therapy Center at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, about developing human gene therapies using recombinant adeno-associated viral vectors, scaling up these therapies, and the future of translational research. Dr. Gao, thank you for joining me. Your research over the years has been essential for making gene therapy possible using recombinant adeno-associated viral vectors. First, I want to go back to the beginning. What inspired you to become a scientist and dedicate your work to translational research? This is a story back to Cultural Revolution in China when I was like a 17-year-old. After high school, I was sent to the countryside to be re-transformed by farmers. So I spent about two and a half years there. And during the time I experienced and saw the sufferers of those farmers from different illnesses, I made my decision that time, if in the future I have a chance to get into college, I will focus on develop medicine to help others. And the translational side, my objective is to develop therapeutics to treat patients. So you must focus on not only just basic discovery, but you need to convert the discovery into applicable medicine for human. So during your graduate work, you researched Canavan disease. What are the hallmarks of this genetic disorder and what inspired you to study it? This is an inherited neurological disorder and primarily affects myelin structure. It's a very devastating disease, and the patient usually dies at an early age because of a neurological and motor dysfunction. There's no treatment to date uh, for the disease. My mentors discovered biochemical defects for the disease. My PhD thesis primarily focused on discovering, cloning the genes for cannabis causative mutations. After I discovered the gene and the mutations that cause cannabis disease, I Ask, what am I going to do now I know what's wrong with cannabis disease? I should start working on therapeutics for this disease, just like I dreamed back in countryside of China. So I decided looking for my postdoc training in gene therapy field. You then did your postdoctoral work with a pioneer of gene therapy, James Watson, at the University of Pennsylvania. What did you work on while in the Watson lab? At that time... Adenovirus-based vector was hyped as the most efficient gene therapy delivery vehicle. And my job was to reduce its toxicity and immunogenicity. I spent about two years on that project. And that vector I developed was used for gene therapy for different genetic diseases, including OTC deficiency, cystic fibrosis, and some other diseases. You eventually switched from working on adenovirus vectors to recombinant adeno-associated viral vectors. What caused that shift and how do those vectors differ? After I finished my postdoc training, Dr. Wilson offered me a position to oversee a GMP manufacturing facility for gene therapy manufacturing. James Wilson assigned me to need a program called a vector program designed for developing next generation gene delivery vehicle and gene therapy vectors. About year and a half, the tragic event happened. One of the gene therapy patients treated for OTC deficiency, Jason Gelsinger, died of immunotoxicity of adenovirus vector. That's back in September 17th, 1999. And that tragic event really suggested that we need a gene therapy vector as efficient as adenovirus 
but much less toxic, much less immunogenic. Some initial publications demonstrate efficiency and stability and the lack of toxicity for prototype of adenosociate virus serotype 2. I start meet with Jim Watson. We discussed what to do next for the vector program. We decided to initiate efforts looking for the next generation of adenosociate virus that is different from AAV serotype 2. Can you tell me more about adeno-associated viruses or AAVs? What are some of their characteristics? This virus was initially discovered as natural contaminants of adenovirus preparations. This is a so-called helper-dependent virus. AAV itself cannot do much until you have co-infection by adenovirus or some other viruses such as herpes simplex virus. And then this virus will become activated it can start replication and the packaging, generate more virus and spread. Most humans likely get infected by this virus. However, AAV has no record to show it causes any diseases. So this is considered to be a non-pathogenic virus. When we generate this virus, we removed all the viral genes, structure genes and regulatory genes from the virus just leave some important packaging signal and replication origin sequence behind. That's called inverted terminal repeats. And they are left ITR and right ITR. They function as replication origin and packaging signal. We clone our gene of interest between these two ITR, then create the virus genome, and then we trans-supplement AAV rep regulatory protein and a capsule protein together with this vector genome helper function from adenovirus, we can package this recombinant AAV vector. This vector is actually a guarded vector, meaning except the two terminal repeats, there's no viral gene there. This further enhanced safety feature of AAV vector. You're still researching how to optimize recombinant AAVs for gene delivery. What are some of the current challenges that you are trying to solve? AAV capsid. It's the biological determinant of AAV's function and the gene delivery vector biology. And AAV vector genome carries your therapeutic gene payload. When those two work together, then you accomplish gene therapy by AAV. If you ask me what are the major barriers for gene therapy currently, the first one is the need for more efficient more specific AAV capsid. The second challenge is manufacturing to make larger quantity, higher quality vectors at reasonable cost. And third, it's immunogenicity and redosing because in our lifetime, we might have been infected by AAV. That kind of set up pre-existing immunity that may block your AAV gene therapy delivery. And also, AAV capsid, AAV genome, once you get into human tissue, you could generate innate response as well as adaptive response to your capsid and to your transgene product. So those may cause some immunogenicity, but compared to adenovirus-based vector, immunogenicity of AAV is much less, particularly at lower doses. If we need second dose of gene therapy vector for other purposes, you cannot use the same serotype of the AAV because you have antibody against it. Currently, you've returned to your Canavan disease research and married that with your AAV work. Tell me about the current status of gene therapy for Canavan disease. After I moved to UMass 2008, I decided to pick up my dream as a teenager to use the gene I discovered as a PhD student, I used the AAV capsule I discovered at the University of Pennsylvania as a poster. AAV serotype 9. This is the most popular AV vectors for gene delivery to treat neurological and neuromuscular diseases. Many drugs are under development using this AAV capsule. So I decided to use AAV9 to deliver healthy, normal genes back to humans. By 2017, we developed further optimized Kahneman gene therapy and worked with a collaborator at the University of Florida, Barry Byrne, to file an IND to FDA to request a first in human clinical trial. 
a patient family who approached me to request for treating their son. That gene therapy trial was quite successful and demonstrated efficacy and safety. Several companies approached UMass to license this drug product, and UMass eventually licensed this product to BridgeBio, a company focused on drug development for rare diseases, and a company called Aspa Therapeutics. Currently, Aspa is conducting phase 1-2 clinical trials at Mass General. They have treated several patients, and patient enrollment is ongoing now. Many people think of gene therapy simply as a way to deliver a fixed or normal copy of a gene to treat a rare genetic disorder. But that's only a portion of what's possible with this technology. What are some other areas where gene therapy can be used? The same concept can also be applied for infectious disease or cancer. Gene therapy vector and the concept can be used for deliver therapeutic antibody that can fight virus to neutralize their infection. And antibody could also kill the cancer cells. Other could be vaccine that we can use this AAV vector concept. We also could treat disease such as diabetes. Some genes can regulate sugar levels. You may not have deficiency in those genes, but you may need more of it in terms of a gene product. You have one foot in academia at the University of Massachusetts Medical School and the other foot in industry. Notably, you started three companies, Voyager Therapeutics, Adrenus Therapeutics, and Aspa Therapeutics, all focused on AAV gene therapy. What inspired you to start these companies and take that leap into industry? My career focused on academic research and research funding primarily supported by NIH. This kind of research is very important for novel discoveries and early product development. But to translate those discoveries to clinical applications, by academic, it's not going to be enough because lack of funding, lack of experience in product development, in drug development. So to really build that translational bridge, we really need to have collaborations, investment, and professional expertise in drug development to set up those or participate or fund those companies for clinical translation of the gene therapy become essential. For researchers who may be branching out in a similar way, what kind of partnerships are important for them to form? You have several levels of a partnership. The first, in my personal experience, is a partnership with patients, patient families, and disease foundations. And that is the basis for our research the second partnership is academic partnership to team up scientists with different expertise, including basic research, bioengineering, physician scientists with clinical background, regulatory scientists to help regulatory document for drug development. And third partnership, our government funding agency. Recently, NIH Foundation developed a great program called the Baseball Gene Therapy Program and got more than hundreds of million dollars and to support pilot gene therapy programs with substantial amount of funding for clinical translation. And the fourth is pharmaceutical or biotech partners for technology transfer, working together for develop CMC or manufacturing pipeline and to perform toxicology and other essential characterizations for further gene therapy development, and for clinical trial design, for patient recruitment, for natural history studies of the disease. Those are all important partnerships. Now let's talk more about manufacturing. What are some challenges that researchers face when scaling up their gene therapy or AAV production from the discovery phase to larger manufacturing for clinical trials? At the discovery phase, after several decades of vector development, Manufacturing AAV for research grade may not be that difficult for small scale production, but for large scale production, then AAV facing different problems. So first issue we have is to transit from an adhering culture for small scale production to suspension culture. Secondly, we cannot use much serum to get rid of those unwanted protein. And third is that current mainstream AAV manufacturing method reliance on transfection, not infection. So you have to deliver vector plasmids, packaging plasmid, and adenovirus helper plasmid into cells by transfection system to manufacturing AAV. 
this is not a very efficient system. That become a limitation, particularly when you deal with hundred liters bioreactors. So that is a very challenging process. Use this triple transition method. The process generate a lot of empty capsid without gene panel. Those empty capsid have no biological effect for gene therapy. If anything, you deliver immunogene to human, which is not safe. So the next challenge in downstream is how to remove those empty capsids and produce vectors that are highly potent for gene delivery. Initial upstream limitation and downstream purification process limitations are what we as an industry trying to overcome to make higher quality, large quantity vectors. UMass Chan Medical School has three gene therapy manufacturing facilities to support translational researchers. What's the overall goal of each facility? The first one is called the research grade small scale vector manufacturing. This is very good for preclinical small scale proof of concept in small animals such as mouse and rats. However, in the gene therapy translational process, we need to test safety or sometimes efficacy in large animals such as canine animal disease model, pigs, sheep, cow, testing non-human primates for toxicity. The small-scale research vector manufacturing would become a challenge because those animals, they are kgs versus with mouse, only 20 grams. We realize the need for a translational large-scale manufacturing facility. In collaboration with Sativa, UMass chain established this large-scale manufacturing core, primarily aimed to provide vectors for translational research in large animals. In addition to that, UMass has a unit called Mass Biologics, and they have a GMP manufacturing facility to manufacturing clinical-grade gene therapy vectors. You mentioned your partnership with Cytiva in building the new AAV large-scale manufacturing facility. What are some of the services and expertise that Cytiva brought to this collaboration? Primarily, facility design and particularly equipment, bioreactors, purification apparatus, and other equipments related to downstream processing. So upstream cell culture, transfection, and downstream viral vector purification. What do you think is the future of translational research? And what are some areas that younger translational scientists should look towards? I think this is a $1 million question. One is understand how our body works to understand the biology at our tissue level, cell level, and gene level, and the messenger RNA level those basic discovery will allow us to develop the gene panel for gene therapy. Second is novel platform technology. One is gene therapy approaches. Initially, we talk about gene replacement when you have non-functional gene where you replace with a normal functional gene. Or you could have a gene addition. You can add in more genes to your body to fight disease. You could also do gene silencing. When you have a disease that caused by mutant gene may become toxic to your body, such as AOS, Huntington disease, you may want to silence in those genes, then you can cure the disease. The newest technology of the gene editing at DNA level and RNA level, there's a new therapy under development called read through therapy. You read through the mutant stop codons to recall the protein that cannot be called. All those are called platform developments at gene payload level. And there may be some other new approaches to be developed sooner or later. The second is delivery platform technology. Currently, the viral delivery seems to be quite good and efficient and popular. But we do need more efficient, safer, and specific viral vectors for gene delivery. So we have plenty of work to do. In complement to viral vectors, we need non-viral vectors for gene delivery you will not generate antibody against your delivery vehicle. Bioengineering is very important for gene therapy manufacturing. We have plenty to learn and to develop, particularly with high quality, larger quantity vectors at lower cost. Do you have any final words of wisdom or advice for translational researchers who are just getting started on their industry journey? I think the one thing I learned is that being a translational researcher, you need to not only see trees, you also need to see forests. To look at the big picture and small picture and the molecular details, but also you need to look at the whole human being and the whole population of the patients.
Thank you for listening to Building Bridges for Translational Research. And thanks again to Guangpeng Gao, Professor and Director of the Horway Gene Therapy Center at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. In the next episode, we'll talk to Linda Matiason, Strategic Customer Leader at Cytiva, about mRNA therapies and opportunities for translational researchers to form worthwhile partnerships. To keep up to date with this podcast, follow The Scientist on Facebook and Twitter and subscribe to The Scientist Lab Talk wherever you get your podcasts.